Well, greetings in Christ's name. It's a real pleasure to be gathered on a New Year's morning. How many of you really need to do some jumping jacks right about now? How many of you feel a need for taking a nap? You know, I went to bed before midnight, so I figured that was okay. But I had coffee last night, so I still stayed awake till midnight. <laughs> Um, but we may have a sleepy crowd today, and I'm not sure if I can keep you awake um, the whole time, but I will try to. Um, the Lord has a message for us. And I was thinking about, you know, maybe during share time we would have a line of people up here ready to share their new inspiration for the year or something, but there were not very many. I think you're too tired. Uh, maybe next Sunday you'll have something to share about what you feel the Lord wants you to do in this new year. Um, but God is really good. God has been good to us. And um, I had a conversation with someone um, who has a different perspective on life than I do. Um, I generally, when I look back over the past year, I mostly see the good things. If there were bad things, I try to forget them. I don't try to dwell on them or think about them. And so when I look over this past year, this past year was a very busy year for me. We built a house. I was ordained, and so life just, things happened that I wasn't used to. And so for some people, that's, it's not that way. It's, they see the hard things that they went through, and it's, it wasn't an easy year. And they notice, well, in some ways, my year was hard too, but I, I see so many good things that God did through that. Um, and I don't know what your perspective is. But as you look into the new year, I, I noticed something about one of the songs we sang this morning. We own the things about the past year. Are we willing to own what we went through, the choices we made, and are we willing to step into the new year and, and own the new year with responsibility? My sermon this morning is uh, titled, Facing Your Fears, or Face Your Fears. And there's a, a kind of a conglomeration of things that kind of came together. I'm not sure that everything really fits together under one solid theme, and I can put the three points together, but there's something here for you. And I want to talk about this. <clears throat> um, I've been intrigued when I listen to some of Jordan Peterson's discussion on Exodus and his discussion about the children of Israel. And he talks about the snakes in the wilderness. And we want to turn to that passage this morning and read that first. Uh, this is not really the main text, but we will be looking at this for a little bit here. Uh, Numbers 21. Do you have things like snakes in your life? Um, just the word snake itself conjures up certain images in our mind. It's, it has some correlation to Satan because of what happened in the Garden of Eden. And we remember that. And then we have this story, and, and these snakes were not a healthy thing. They were not a good thing. Uh, however, the Lord actually sent these snakes because of something they did. And then the way the Lord deals with the snakes is so different as well. And then later on, we have Christ who is also raised up on a cross like the serpent in the desert. So let's read um, Numbers 21, verses 1 through 9. The king of Arad, the Canaanite, who dwelt in the south, heard that Israel was coming on the road to Atharim. Then he fought against Israel and took some of them prisoners. So Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed deliver this people into my hand, then I will utterly destroy their cities. And the Lord listened to the voice of Israel and delivered them, and delivered up the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them in their cities. So the name of this place was called Horma. Verse 4 now, the bronze serpent. Then they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the soul of the people became very discouraged on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. 
So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Therefore, the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and it shall be that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. We'll stop there. The Israelites were complaining. They were very discouraged. They had had hard times, and it didn't look like the hard times were stopping. It was still a long journey ahead of them. They just either wanted to be at Canaan already, or back in Egypt where it was easier. But not this 40 years of just wandering around and slowly making progress. Not really, it didn't look like they were making much progress, which was also a punishment on their own uh, sin. But here they were discouraged, and they began to complain. And they complained so much against God and Moses that God sent fiery serpents, or poisonous snakes. And these poisonous snakes bit people, people started to die, and there was just a really hard, a really hard time. And you would think, okay, let's pray to God, and then we're finally turning to God, and God's going to wipe these snakes out. Let's remove the snakes. That's what they were asking God to do, and God didn't do that. God actually said, well, okay, Moses, go make another bigger snake and put it on a pole, put it on a staff, and the staff was likely the staff that Moses used, I'm not sure, and he put a serpent on a staff, and if you're bitten, then look at this snake. Look at this bronze one. This wasn't some cure-all, the snakes are going to now vanish. You complained. The circumstances you have are now upon you. This isn't exactly going away. But I will give you a remedy. I'll give you a solution. Look to this serpent. And why a serpent? Of all things, why not a... Uh, why not something else? Like, why not another staff that budded or something else? But it was a very similar thing to what they were facing. They feared the snakes. The snakes bit them. They hated the snakes. And yet... God was asking them to go look at another snake. What do you have in your life that might be similar? We face things in our lives that are hard, really hard. And sometimes we just want God to take them away. There's been times in my life when I wanted God to take something away. And God didn't take it away. And I found at some point that when I turned and said, Thank you, God, for this hardship, this thing that I fear most, thank you, God, for bringing it in my life, that I started finding a new path out of that a deep distress that the fear caused. And here God is asking the Israelites, Face your fear head on. Look it straight in the face and do something about it. Don't stay in your tent if the snake bit you. Or don't try to run away from the camp of Israel. Or don't try to hide. Face your fear and look the serpent right in the face. And I, that just seems kind of strange. Why was God asking them to look at this snake? And yet sometimes the only way for us to move forward is to face the very, the very thing that is causing us the greatest distress. But what do snakes represent in your life and in my life? Now, I already made an allusion to that a snake was sort of an allusion to Satan or something evil, like it did for Eve in the garden. But today we have snakes in our lives. There, there, are, there are snakes in the world. There's the things that want to destroy us. They want to bite us and kill us and take us away from the fold of God, take us away from the protection of Christ. They want to destroy us. It's the world. The world is as a snake in our lives. And then the snake comes closer home. There is a snake that dwells within me. My own selfishness, my own self-centered longings, desires. That one wants to destroy me as well. 
And that snake will destroy me if I don't look to Christ. And if I don't look this snake straight on the head and say, this snake must die like Eugene said this morning. I cannot let this snake live. I must let it die and willingly take on the cross of Christ. Sometimes it may be consequences of our sins. It may even be enemies of ours and the snake that dwells within our enemies. And when we deal with those, there's very little we can do about it. Um, Jesus did talk to us about being peacemakers and loving our enemies, but me being able to change the snake in my enemy is really, really hard. And yet, am I willing to face my fear, my greatest fear, head on, and say, I will do something about this snake and not allow it to conquer me? What can we do to find healing when we have been bitten? The children of Israel looked to a bronze snake. Um, I don't know how many of you read the article from Faith Builders that was put in your mailbox, but uh, Stephen Brubaker on the front page talks about a little passage, and let's turn to this passage and read it, and then I'll make a few comments. 2 Kings 18. Do you know what the children of Israel did with this bronze snake? I never thought about it. What happened? I didn't even know that the scriptures talked about the bronze snake again, except that it says that Christ will be lifted up like a snake in the wilderness. But here it is in 2 Kings. Hezekiah is a good king. Hezekiah destroyed many things that the Israelites were worshiping. Israel was already being taken captive, and Hezekiah was king of Judah in the, the southern kingdom. And Hezekiah followed Ahab. Ahab was a wicked king, and yet Hezekiah was a good king. Hezekiah, let, I'm sorry, um, 2 Kings 18, verses 1 through 6. And so it was when King Hezekiah heard it that he tore his clothes, covered himself with sackcloth, and went into the house of the Lord. Then he sent Eliakim, who was over the household, Shebna, the scribe, and the elders of the priests, covered with sackcloth, to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. And they said to him, Thus says Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and rebuke and blasphemy, for the children have come to birth, but there is no strength to bring them forth. It may be that the Lord your God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom his master, the king of Assyria, has sent to reproach the living God, and will rebuke the words which the Lord your God has heard. Yes. Um, are you not with me? Thank you very much. I was reading a longer than I was thinking it was for me to get to the, to the punchline. 2 Kings 18, verse 1. Thank you, John. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, the king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places, and broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images, and broke down and broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the children of Israel burned incense to it, and called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor who were before him. For he held fast to the Lord and did not depart from following him, but he kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. King Hezekiah destroyed the high places, the sacred pillars, the wooden images, plus he destroyed the bronze serpent. And what's the connection here? Before we lump all of this together in the same thing, we have to remember the bronze serpent was a thing that God had told Moses to make. This was something God had given them. This was a gift of healing for these people at one point. But here the people were continuing to give offerings of some sort to a gift that God gave them, not to the giver of the gift. And sometimes we do the same thing. We've been given wonderful gifts. I'm thinking just now even of um, um, our, our exhortation this morning by Dwight and Bill. 
Let's not make culture our God. Culture was given to us as a gift, and there were many wonderful things that we are able to pass on to our families through this Mennonite culture. But let's not make this our God. It will not heal us. And if we keep offering sacrifices to this Mennonite God, or this Mennonite culture thing, that will destroy us. And here, finally, Hezekiah noticed these people are completely misusing this gift. This gift is no longer in being supposed to be used. Let's remove it. And Hezekiah destroyed it. I'm not insinuating that we should destroy things in our culture that are valuable gifts for us today and that are working for us. Please don't misunderstand me. But I am saying that if there is something that we're looking to for healing that's not God himself, then we're looking at the wrong places. I want to read a quote from Stephen Brubaker. With time, however, the means of God's grace became a substitute for him. Rather than bringing the needy to God, the bronze snake became an end in itself. The people began to hope and trust in the gift of God, rather than the one who made the gift possible. And because of the proximity of the gift and the giver, it took a while for them to notice the difference. When we love and obey God, he blesses us. It is sobering to realize that with time, the blessing can compete for our love. And that's what happens. We can sometimes forget, because of the closeness and proximity of the gift of God and God himself, we don't always differentiate clearly enough, early enough, and realize that we need to always be looking to God and love him and not the blessing that he's given. So are we willing to face the hardest things in our lives? There are areas of deep brokenness in our community, in our world, and are we willing to look at it? What would happen if I took 100% responsibility of the things that I am most afraid of and I would just deal with it? If I wouldn't overthink it, if I would just do something about it, move ahead instead of avoiding it, and if I decided to do this every time that I face something big, if I face a fear, anything that scares me, every time I will take 100% responsibility and do something about it. When people become responsible like this, that already makes life better. That already is a huge step forward. Okay, let's turn to Luke chapter 4. This is really the text that I wanted to read today. Luke 4. Verse 14, in our Sunday school this morning, uh, we talked about John preaching in the wilderness and Jesus preaching in the synagogues. And here's a sermon of Jesus preaching in the synagogue. And we'll notice some culture things. We notice that he stood up to, to read and then he sat down and while sitting, he continued to expound about what was going on. Let's read. Verse 14 through 30 of Luke chapter 4. Then, we, then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went through all the surrounding region. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. When he opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So all bore witness to his words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? He said to them, You will surely say this proverb to me, Physician, heal yourself. Whatever we heard done in Capernaum, do also here in your country. And then he said, Assuredly, I say to you, 
No prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you truly, many widows were in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heaven was shut up three, and a, three years and six months, and there was great famine throughout all the land. But to none of them was Elijah sent except to Zarephath in the region of Zidon, to a woman who was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Elisha the prophet, and none of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, but they, that they might throw him down over the cliff. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. It's just a fascinating story. And um, this passage is so familiar to us. Yes, we know Jesus came and preached this. He opened this scroll and he read the prophecy and he said, Today this is happening. Today I am bringing deliverance. But I want us to notice something. They were, the people sitting in the synagogue were amazed at what Jesus said. The gracious words that were coming forth, they were amazed. They, they loved to hear what he was saying. And there was a little bit of, I'm not sure if they were just surprised or whether they were a little cynical. Is this not the son of Joseph? But Jesus wanted them to notice something. Jesus wanted them to notice that when he preached this gospel, this new message, it was not so much that he was coming on a white horse to reign and kick out the Romans and establish a new kingdom in world power. He wanted them to realize this was a kingdom that was very different. And then he, he wants to, he points this out. Look back in Israel. Look when Elijah was in his land prophesying. Who did Elijah go to? God sent him to a woman that was a Gentile, and that woman was the one who provided for him. What about Elisha? All the people who were lepers, there were plenty of lepers, God sent a Gentile to Elisha to be healed. And Jesus uses two examples that possibly were almost an embarrassment to the Jews. And he says, look, our message that prophecy of deliverance, of freedom, is actually not just for you Jews. It is for all the Gentiles. And that made them so angry. They kicked him out. They could not hear him any longer. Forget about the amazing words that they thought he was saying earlier. Forget about all that. They were tired of him. And they kicked him out. Let's turn real quickly to Isaiah 61. I want you to notice what Jesus omitted in his sermon. He did not preach the whole sermon that Isaiah had given. Isaiah 61 verse 2. In the middle of a section, and where did Jesus stop? I'll read verse 2. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, comma. But Jesus stopped right there, and he did not go on, and he did not say, and the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus recognized that he was bringing the kingdom and freedom was being given to people, to the Jews and to the Gentiles. But he said, today is not the, king, the day of vengeance where God will take vengeance over all people. There is going to be a time where this gospel is going to be shared to people even beyond your synagogues, beyond the Jewish people. This message of hope is for us today. I really like just how Luke brings out that Jesus walked with the source of the Holy Spirit guiding him. Uh, we start at the very beginning and it says, and, and even if you look further back, Jesus was guided by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted. Here he was guided by the power of the Spirit into Galilee. And when he spoke, God's Spirit was guiding him. And he speaks very clearly about this fivefold ministry. He said, I came to preach the gospel to the poor. Are you poor today? Jesus cares about our needs. He sees it when you've been taken advantage of, and He cares. And He knows what it's like to not have enough. 
But he says that he has good news for you, that he will be with you until justice comes. Jesus brings the gospel to the poor. He says he came to heal the brokenhearted. Some of you have felt deeper pain than words can describe. You felt so hopeless that you didn't know if hope could ever be restored. You felt like you would have to be cynical and depressed for the rest of your life. You probably felt like dying at some point rather than living. And Jesus cares about how you feel. He promised to heal the brokenhearted, not just to care, but to heal the brokenhearted. Jesus said, I proclaim liberty to the captives or to the prisoners. If you've become a prisoner to some cruel master that won't let you go, Jesus came to free you, completely free you. Do you face addictions? Do you face self-centeredness, bitterness? Jesus will open the doors of that prison and let you out. Jesus said, I proclaim recovery of sight to the blind. If you're like me, you face blindness sometimes. We have blind spots. We might recognize a problem, but we might be completely unaware of how to solve the problem or to even pinpoint what the problem is. Or others might see something in me and I can't get sight of it. I can't understand what they're seeing. I don't see what they see. There might be blindness. And Jesus gives spiritual eyesight and he will help you see things you've never seen before that will give you direction and hope. Jesus proclaims recovery of sight to the blind. Jesus set at liberty those who are oppressed. Jesus sees when we are crushed and bruised by sin. Maybe our own sin. But sometimes the bruising is abuse that we didn't do. Other people's sin. You didn't deserve the thing that happened to you. But it happened. And you're bruised and broken and Jesus came to give you liberty. You don't have to live in that bruised and crushed and dejected state. When Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring this to you, and that this is the acceptable year of the Lord, Jesus spoke right to us. He was speaking to each one of us, and we can come to Christ. And I want us to just realize, as we move into the new year, as we face our own fears, and as we look at the things that are really, really hard for us. Um, I, I recently posted a quote um, and I'm, I might be paraphrasing this, but our church as, is as strong as the conversations that we're not willing to have. If we're avoiding certain conversations, if we're avoiding certain topics because they're too scary for us and we don't want to talk about them, we don't want to face them, then that's how strong our church is going to be. And that's how strong your spiritual life will be. But if we're willing to face the hardest conversations we need to have, and say, Jesus has an answer. We're going to press into it. We're going to open this up. Christ will bring liberty for us. The Jews drove Jesus out of the synagogue over this message. When they realized what Jesus was saying, they rejected him. Because he didn't meet their expectation of a Messiah. But when Jesus comes to us, and he wants to pinpoint an area in our life that he wants to work on, are we going to chase him out as well? Or we're going to receive him and say, Jesus, come and work. This is a topic I don't ever want to talk about. It's too hard. It's too painful. I'm afraid of it. But Jesus, I want you to come in and speak to me. Let's love and obey him and we will be blessed. I want to read a final passage as a closing prayer. Just as a blessing. Proverbs 2 verse 6.
Proverbs 2, verses 6 through 10, and I'm going to lead, read this in the New Living Translation. For the Lord grants wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He grants a treasure of common sense to the honest. He is a shield to those who walk with integrity. He guards the paths of the just and protects those who are faithful to him. Then you will understand what is right, just, and fair, and you will find the right way to go. For wisdom will enter your heart and knowledge will fill you with joy. Let's bow our heads forward in prayer. Father, we're grateful today that you came and shared the message of hope. And this message of hope is alive for us today, and we want to receive this message. Help us to receive your wisdom, to face our fears, and to walk in obedience to you this new year. In Jesus' name, amen.